Our gospel for this Sunday comes to us from the ninth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, uh, this is a continuation of last week's story. Jesus is going along and he's telling his disciples again, you know, he is going to be rejected and he's going to be crucified and he will die and he will rise again. And they didn't get it. And so much so that they were arguing over which one of them was the greatest. And Jesus is telling them, you want to be the greatest of all, you must be the servant of all. And then put a child into their midst and said, someone who re- you know, welcomes one such as this welcomes also me. Well, apparently there's still a lot of learning to do. Then John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of our Lord. Amen. Such a happy, joyful gospel, isn't this? Well, you know, one of the things I've noticed about Americans is we don't tend to pay attention to a lot of things going on in the world. Did any of you know that over the summer that the president of Sweden was, there was an election for president of Sweden, and the new president was the president of Ikea? It took a while for him to assemble his cabinet, though. The real interesting thing is a bunch of people were questioning if there were some improprieties, but the lawyers who were assigned to investigate the case had difficulty putting their case together. In the end, he just resigned because, you know, he just decided he needed to take time and pull himself together. So, you know, I know. Didn't you know that the word IKEA is actually Swedish for marriage test? Actually, you know, actually, a group of us pastors were talking about the fact that the best test to see if a couple has it is they have to take a road trip to an Ikea, pick out a piece of furniture, bring it back, and assemble it. If you still want to get married afterwards, you should be golden. Now, <laughs> there was an entertainment center in our past, yes, yeah. you know. Yes, is it, you know, trying to put those things together. But also, how do you deal with one another? How do you react to one another as you put? That's the real test, isn't it? How do you respond to one another? So how do you respond to this gospel lesson that seems to be, um, well, a little brutal, isn't it? It sounds like, if you remember this from history classes, you know, old world history class, the Code of Hammurabi. You know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It was, you know, a lot of people nowadays, we look at that and we go, just how ugly and brutal was that? Do you realize that at the time it was a massive progressive act? Because before that it didn't matter what you did. There was no such thing as let the punishment fit the crime. You stole a loaf of bread, you trespassed, you murdered, you committed treason, you decided to jaywalk. You were murdered, you were executed. That was the penalty. So actually saying there should be something was actually an improvement. Isn't it nice to know that some things supposedly show improvement over time? So why do we still practice some of this? Why do we still react to people sometimes this way? 
you're going to get yours. And notice that 2,000 years ago, Jesus is saying these things. As I was growing up, my youngest brother was eight years younger than me. He turns 42 on, on Tuesday. And when I was like in upper elementary, he was still home. And I would walk in the front door after school, and he would tend to greet me with a punch. Mom never seemed to be around when he was there to greet me with a punch. But somehow she would magically transport herself and, you know, decloak right there when I got, finally got my hands around my youngest brother's neck and I was going to ring him. David, what are you doing? Mom! You're the older brother. You're supposed to know better. You're supposed to set the example. I'm seeing a bunch of older siblings I know shake your heads, go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Some of you younger ones, you do realize that the reason why you survived was because your parents said that? You know, the thought of taking a pillow into my brother's room in the middle of the night? You know, as much as I hated it, it actually taught me an important lesson that I'm still learning. We won't say how many years later. And that is this. I have no control over his action. But I have control over my reaction. That's what I'm called to be mindful of. How am I responding to the situation? Yes, oh boy, is it easy. Eye for an eye, a punch for a punch. He wasn't punching me in the eye, by the way. He was only this tall, comparatively to me. Use your imagination. And now understand why I really wanted to wring his neck. It's about how we respond. How do we respond to other people? How do you respond to your neighbor? How do you respond to a situation that happens? Something that is, I mean, let's face it, the other person, the other situation is beyond your control. If you honestly believe that you have control, you're deluding yourself, save yourself the energy. Yeah, you might be able to encourage, you may be able to teach, you may be able to, you know, kind of, but let's face it, ultimately, they are exercising a choice to do what they're doing, and you are exercising your choice to respond the way you do. So choose wisely. You have no control over the other person. Now, I do not want this, I just want to be very clear on this. This is not a statement of, okay, suck it up, buttercup, and just deal with it. All right? This is not about accepting the action that comes at you. There is no justification for continued violence and oppression and everything else like that. This is not an argument for quietude and passivity. This is actually just calling you to be mindful of how you're responding because, let's face it, responding to evil for evil just creates more evil. Paul even talked about that. So do not respond to evil, but respond to evil with love. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, hate is too great a burden to bear, so I will choose love. But you notice he didn't just suck it up. How do we respond? And let's face it, this whole lesson, if you take, take a look at it, this whole thing that he's reading is how do you respond? What do you do? when you're dealing with things. Someone else is doing something that you do, and they're not doing it like you, or they're not doing it with you. Make them stop. We heard that in the first lesson, too. These two people are prophesying in the camp, but they didn't go to the tent. And Moses is like, if everyone would at least prophesy, I'd be happy. 
These people are doing deeds of power. They're exercising demons, but they're not one of us. Make them stop. Why? Are they doing a good thing? Yes. Are they doing it with you or, be, you know, with, you know, alongside you? No. So what? Remember, in the first lesson, the reason why all of these elders were brought in and given this power was so that all the weight was not on Moses. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples because this one who is going to be crucified and died and buried is going to eventually rise again and ascend, but then it's going to be these 12 going to be responsible. So wouldn't it be nice to have some help? But how often do we shut someone else down because they didn't do it my way? Or the approved way? Notice your reaction. How are we supposed to add more hands to God's work if we keep slapping hands that try to do work? And Jesus is rather pointed about this. You know, it would be better if you got this giant millstone. Okay, these are stones that are standing about this tall, all right, that used to grind, you know, wheat down into flour. So it's about this tall and about this wide and it's solid stone. It's better if you have one of those things as a necklace while you go swimming. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. What? But what people, should I be cutting out their eyes and cutting off their hands and cutting off their feet because they're sinning? No, this is not about them. This is about your reaction. This is about what you are doing. This is about a call to be mindful to yourself and how you are proclaiming in word and deed. And what? you're proclaiming in word and deed. How are we responding? You know, how, you know, whenever you were learning, just learning how to do something, did you learn best by someone smacking your hand and telling you you did it wrong and go away? Or did you learn best by being corrected and told and having some, more importantly, having someone there with you? showing you and working alongside you? You know, two weeks ago, we celebrated God's work, our hands. Wouldn't it be nice to have more hands? How are we cutting off hands because of how we're reacting and responding? Oftentimes, it's because maybe we don't think we can or we're good enough. We tell ourselves, well, I don't know. So should I even bother? Should I even try? Cut off our hands. We shut our eyes to things going on, so we might as well pull them out. If we're not going to go and help, we might as well cut off our feet. What good is they? Because what Jesus is talking about all this time, about, oh, going off into hell and stuff like that, you do realize that what he's talking about is the fact that people are in hell as in a hellish situation. Your choice. How are you going to respond? What are you going to do? Are you going to close your eyes? Put your hands in your pockets? Walk away? Or are you going to do something? Are you going to sustain these people? Are you going to give them a cup of cold water? Or are you going to dump it over their head? Are you going to receive a cup of cold water from them because they're different? Where are you going to go thirsty? Everyone's salted with fire. So if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? Isn't that a ridiculous statement? It's basically saying, be who you're supposed to be. If you stop being who you're supposed to be, you're not, you know, if salt stops being salt, what is it? How are we taking what we have 
what we've been blessed with and sharing it. How are we re reacting to that? How are we responding to that? How are we responding to the gifts and talents that are coming to us in varieties of ways from different people? How are we finding ways in which we build up one another as little ones in faith, as children of God? By fundamentally reminding ourselves we're loved. And so are they. But again, sometimes we just don't, we're afraid. In the beginning of the Reformation, Philip Melanchthon was Martin Luther's number two. And he heard that this was so important, you know, preaching the word was so important that he was actually afraid to do it. He didn't, he was, he didn't trust himself. And so Martin Luther penned this letter to him, and within this bulk of the letter, he commented that, yeah, basically, yeah, we're going to screw up. We're not going to do it right. There are things with the best of intentions. Which is, it's just not going to end up right. You might walk away from the sermon and go, what the heck is pastor saying? Yeah. I often ask myself that same question. But Martin Luther responded in this letter with, sin boldly, but believe even more boldly the promises you are proclaiming. Now, here's the sad fact. That's a lovely comment, isn't it? It's a reminder of the fact that we're still called to do it, but also as, you know, if we're going forward proclaiming in word and deed the good news, the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, then maybe, just maybe, we should believe that we got it too? So if it doesn't go the right way, we don't. it doesn't seem to happen, we're still loved, God's mercy is still good, grace is still present? But if you Google sin boldly, you will find thousands of hits about how awful Lutherans are by other denominations because they're telling you to just go sin! See, they're doing things different than we are. Tell them to stop. How we react and respond to each other as Christians. Guess what? Most people in the world can't tell the difference between a Lutheran, Lutheran a Methodist, or an Episcopalian, or a Baptist, or any of them. But they can tell when we're not nice to each other. It says a lot how you react and how you respond to one another. It would be better if we cut off a hand or anything else like that. We have been graced and loved with our imperfections, with our problems, with our sin, with our brokenness. And God comes to us in Jesus, in love and peace and hope and grace to show us life and to show us all of these gifts at work. We're called to follow. We're called to take up a cross and follow this one who showed us what it meant. But more importantly, he did it for you, for me, for your neighbor, for your enemy. How will we take that gift of grace and respond to you, to me, to our neighbor, to our enemy? Well, let's remind ourselves of what we've got, the gift in baptism, the promises God gave us, the promises we poured over the Robbie back there last Sunday. And so let's remind ourselves all of these things. That this is what God gives us in baptism. Can you repeat after me, please? I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I've been marked with the cross of Christ forever. I am Christ's. You are blessed. You are given what is needed. You're given the cross by which to carry to carry out to others that message of life and love and, more importantly, new life and always claimed as God's own. 
And so, as you find ways to respond to this good news, may others see and let that light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify our Father in heaven. May they see the love that you have in how you respond to them. Remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen.